Hello everyone, welcome to ACE Online and welcome to Daily Current Affairs session. So today we will discuss the current affairs of 15th March. Before uh, going into the detailed discussion, let's see what all the articles are there for today's session. Okay. So first one uh, related to the sports, Ranji Trophy. So the headline of our session was national, international. We are covering everything, whatever relevant for our exams, we are covering everything, okay, including the sports. Uh, like KLO India, we have discussed many times, right? So Ranji Trophy, the winners uh, was Mumbai 42nd title. So we will see not just the winners, but the background, like what is actually the Ranji Trophy and when it was launched and what is the significance. So all these things we will see in detail, okay? Next one, electoral bonds data in public domain. So electoral bonds we have discussed many times. Anyway, briefly we will discuss and the data that was kept in front of the public, we will see them in detail, okay? Next, Rhodamine B, it was banned. It was an agent chemical compound banned in Tamil Nadu and Karnataka as well. So we'll see what is the background, why they have banned, right? In exam point of view, it is also very important. National mission on edible oils. So the first oil mill under this project was recently launched by our Honorable Prime Minister. So that's why we have taken this article from Press Information Bureau. Next, again article taken from PIB only, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity. So it is an international agreement, we will see in detail. Then Sagar Parikrama, a campaign, uh, a tour like thing across Indian coastal uh, region. So we'll see that as well. Then. Ministry of Minority Affairs has given certain approvals. These are factual in nature, but I felt, yes, there is a scope that where is this headquarters of this institute, something like that they may ask in the exam. For briefly, we will see it, okay? Very factual in nature. Next, Central Road Infrastructure Fund. So our uh, Ministry of Road has granted a lot of funds to different states uh, under this, uh, I mean, through this fund. So we'll see in detail about this as well. Gender Inequality Index 2022. So this year is 2024, but the data, the report was published of the data related to 2022. It was just passed, oh, sorry, it was just launched a day before. We will see that details as well. And we have very good number of facts, more than like five to six facts, factual points are there. We will see that as well. And finally, practice questions. Okay. Right. I hope you are ready for the session. And in case if you have any doubts, you can always ask here. Okay. Yeah, very good evening Mal Malini, welcome to the session. Let's start the session without delay. The first uh, article is related to the Ranji Trophy. If you are a cricket fan, you might have uh, saw the scorecard, the winners, especially those persons who always checks uh, Crick Buzz or ESPN Crick Info. So this is just very popular. Mumbai has bet the Vidarbha in the Ranji Trophy final 2023-24. Okay, so the Mumbai are the winners and Vidarbha is the runners. They may ask in the exam as well. And what is this Ranji Trophy? That is important for us. This was a test match. Test match in the sense it is an unlimited over. It is not a limited. It is a five-day tourney. For every match we have five days, right? It was launched to honor the India's first cricketer. India's first ever known cricketer. Maybe yes, someone might have played. But Ranjit... Sinji. So he was the first known Indian cricketer to honor his name. So we have launched Ranji Trophy by taking the uh, starting uh, first half of the name. He was, he did not, never, I mean, he never played to Indian cricket team, but he played for England and Sussex way back in 1920s uh, and 30s. So to honor him, we have launched this Ranji Trophy in 1934, way back, right? So it's approximately 90 years back we have launched this and it was launched by BCCA, I mean Board of Cricket Control for India, right? So this is the history. Now he is also known as father of Indian cricket, right? So this all facts may be asked in the exam, maybe in statement based something like that they may ask. So he was also called as father of Indian cricket, very important fact. And this Ranji Trophy is a domestic first class cricket. That means domestic in the sense within India. The teams from India will compete. Like you can say based on uh, states. And also we have uh, not only government teams, uh, so not only state teams, the board teams. We have also government, uh, what you call teams like services, railways. These are all what? Government departments. And the people who are playing or who are uh, from that particular railway department who are interested in cricket, they are formed as a team and 
participate here like services we have different teams not just boards but also the government office teams are also playing under this tournament right so this is very important thing to be remember and this is a test match right so the mumbai has won the most they may ask in the statement base that this particular team has won the most of the title something like that so mumbai has won the 42nd title yesterday and this is total 42 times they have won since its inception after that karnataka or mysore state they have won the second highest number of titles that will be sufficient no need to remember everything third is delhi so first two are more important who are the winners who has got the more titles something like that they may ask okay next they may ask you about this year trophy some statistics as well related to this particular year no need to go for previous year statistics that is not relevant so this is the 89th session 89th season since its inception this is the 89th time that we have uh, conducted the ranji trophy the total number of teams 38 teams and the total matches that played including the final are 138 so here 38 38 is common so you can remember it with the clue and the player of the series the total complete the tournament tanush kotiyan from mumbai he is an all rounder who can both uh, i mean bat as well as bowl so he is the man of the series most runs of this tournament was made by ricky bui from andhra team okay then most wickets were taken by sai kishor from tamil nadu so these are all facts they may ask anyway like direct fact or maybe statement based you have to remember all these facts okay so we as the context has come uh, we want to discuss with you some trophies popular cricket trophies as well beyond ranji trophy we have five six important trophies that are relevant for our exam dulip trophy it is named after again one of the cricketers kumar shri dulip sinji so he was uh, the, also the cricketer and it was started in 1961 62 and this is also the test match test matches i mean uh, five days okay there is no limited every day 90 overs will be bowled so it is for five days right then the other trophy it is a 50 over game so limited over cricket game and it was started in 1973 74 they may ask you the chronology order as well first is ranji trophy then dulip trophy then the other trophy and this only two are test matches ranji trophy and dulip trophy this the other trophy is a limited 50 overs next vijay hazare trophy again this is a limited over uh, cricket for i um, mean to honor the vijay hazare he is also the cricketer right so this is uh, the third tro important trophy that need to be remember this is a limited over like 50 over game one day international next irani cup so we just have seen that ranji trophy has won by mumbai right and there are other teams who participated total 38 are there 37 were not able to win and the mumbai has won so this irani cup is conducted by uh, versus mumbai i mean the winners vi winners of that year ranji trophy versus rest of the teams rest of teams so there are total number of hundreds of cricketers so they will select 11 members in the end so mumbai versus whatever the winners of the ranji trophy versus the rest of the team members so that is irani cup right very important it was started in 1960 okay then the last tourney said musak ali trophy so this is the t20 game so 20 over game only 20 over game that is conducted by the bcci on regular basis is said musak ali trophy it was started in 2008 9 right so this teams are of belong to ranji trophy so whatever the teams that participate in ranji trophy are participated in the said musak ali trophy as well right so these are all the popular cricket tournaments beyond ranji trophy any doubts in this yeah so we have seen very in detail uh, about the history of ranji trophy when it was emerged the facts are all very very important it is factually nature right so i cannot explain like a concepts it is just a factual i have collected and uh, we have discussed here you have to remember that is your duty okay next article related to the electoral bonds which the data has kept in front of the public domain before going into what actually is electro, uh, electoral bonds and all i just want to discuss a little bit the context electoral bonds was launched way back in 2015 or 16 right since then they were continue to donate 
the money i mean i'll i'll show you what is electoral bonds how it works anyway just understand that the money were given by some corporates or individuals to the certain political parties whatever they wish but recently supreme court has struck down that electoral bonds are unconstitutional it is again as the constitutional values so no more electoral bonds are allowed and whatever till now that uh, uh, you know the donation has come has to keep in front of the public everyone has to know who has donated to whom how much money has come to the political parties so that's why sbi has kept or sbi has submitted it to the election commission as directed by the supreme court supreme court has asked sbi sbi is the sole bank to release the electoral bonds right so sbi has given it to the election commission and election commission has kept in its website so whoever want to see or those are all can see the details right so that is the context that uh, election commission has published the data in public domain now what actually are pub, uh, electoral bonds bonds you know right so someone will uh, give i mean whoever want to invest in bonds they can buy the bonds they can give money to them and you will get the interest for buying that bond right so that is the mechanism of bonds but in case of electoral bonds they are bearer instrument very very important this to be understood please try to understand here bearer instrument means those bonds which does not mention any ownership so there won't be any owner written on the bond unlike the other normal bonds whoever has held that for example i am holding that bond with me today so i am the owner tomorrow some person b has held that so he is the owner right so bearer instruments means bearer means holder right so there is no ownership written on that whoever has holding that bond are the owners right so they are bearer instruments where any person can buy and donate it to the political party for example i have bought this bond from sbi for 10000 rupees so i am the owner now tomorrow i will give it to some political party p okay so they will get this particular bond and they are the owners now what they will do they will go to sbi again so from sbi i have taken the bond right so now i have taken the bond i have donated to political party p and this party will go to sbi and say that this is by my donation so i want 10000 rupees so this bond will be given to sbi and the money is collected right so that's how the electoral bonds uh, has worked and it is very uh, you know simple thing to understand that any political party needs funding and almost every individual or companies has certain political affiliations you me anyone have certain affiliation towards any political party so you can donate to anyone that is the aim that anyone wish to do this they can donate right that's how the democracy works right so that is about the electoral bonds working mechanism and who can buy this any indian only not foreigners can buy this only indian individuals or indian companies incorporated right so only those persons or any you know company are eligible to buy this bond and they can donate it to the political parties right so these are as i said they don't have any interest usually bonds have certain interest that if i am taking bond i am giving 1000 rupees money i need to get some interest 10% 5% then only i will buy the bond so that i will get more money but these bonds does not have any interest even if the political party even if i have bought this 10000 i won't get any 10% interest or even this political party won't get any interest the face value itself is given it so they are non interest non interest bearing bonds okay very very important that point has to be remembered now uh, the electoral bonds will not have any name as i said so that is the context what supreme court has struck down that some mischievous things may donate to particular political parties and it is against the democracy uh, against the article 19 right to freedom or right to information to know it right so sbi is the only sole bank to give those those bonds this is the mechanism of electoral bonds i hope it is clear i am not discussing in detail like who or how many days and all that we have already discussed in the sessions now what we need to uh, understand here the data that was kept in front of the public domain by election commission of india has to be remembered so this facts may be asked in the exams yes yes amcbwd you are correct we will see that as well that which party has got more funding and all those facts they will ask in the exam so now we have discussed the electoral bonds 
let's see who got the highest amount right and those other important data as well first you can see here bjp bharti janata party has got the highest amount out of total 12200 crore approximately they have 6000 almost 50% it is 47% it was said so bjp has got the highest followed by trinamool congress in west bengal it is not the congress usually congress is the uh, biggest party isn't it since 1885 even before independence but all india trinamool congress got the second highest this one these numbers are not important don't worry these numbers are not important just remember these parties which got the highest that's all then congress then brs bharati uh, bharat rashtra samiti in telangana biju janata dal so just 3 4 will be sufficient to be remembered right no need to worry about remembering all the things that is not relevant for our exam now okay fine parties we have came to know now who has donated the highest that is also important future gaming and hotel services pr so this is the company which has given the highest funds to the electoral bond so this is the single largest donor since 2019 to 2024 this is the single largest company which has donated the highest amount to the electoral bonds so that is also important next followed by mega engineering and infrastructure limited so that is based on hyderabad so this company is the second okay the total value that was donated was 12155 crore but this was uncashed the total uncashed amount i mean the political parties taken amount was 12769 the total donation was 12155 but the parties has taken 12769 so it is more than that can anyone uh, you know identify this why it has happened so it should be less than this right whatever the donation that amount the whatever the encashment has been done should be less than this or equal to be this but this is more because the data that sbi has released is only since april 12 2016 to 2019 but the data prior to it since 2016 the data was not released so that's why there was a mismatch maybe they have encashment has after delay for example i have launched this i have taken this bond on january 1 but the encashment was done in the after 4 5 days january 5 something so maybe because of the deadline there was a mismatch uh, between this encashment and the donation donation one right so these are all the details that are relevant for our exam okay we have seen what is electoral bonds how they work and uh, finally we have seen the important data that is really revealed into the public domain any doubts in this okay i hope uh, there are no doubts from your side now let's move to the next article very factual in nature of course this one as well rhoda mine b but they will ask you this in the exam for sure any exam you write they will ask you this right so rhoda mine b this chemical compound was banned by tamil nadu as well as karnataka recently this particular tamil nadu okay so, sorry it is not they did not ban this chemical rather they have ba- banned the sale of cotton candy you might have eaten this in the childhood right so everyone uh, has uh, this uh, you know might have experienced this in the childhood especially so tamil nadu has banned this cotton candy they did not ban uh, rhodomine b uh, so you don't confuse with that they have banned only selling of cotton candy because it was found that this rhodomine b was found in this cotton candies we will see what is rhodomine b and all don't worry just understand the context that tamil nadu has banned this because rhodomine b was present in this cot, uh, cotton candies now what is this rhodomine b as i said earlier it is a chemical compound which can be soluble in water soluble means like a salt how it becomes a solution within water so it is a soluble chemical compound and it is used for color so if this is mixed in water and put it on cloths or any other material that we need it will give color okay so this rhodomine b is a dye a chemical po- compound which is used for dyeing the textiles papers and then paints to get the color right so it is a coloring agent coloring compound which gives the certain colors like pink right even green also it will give right so certain uh, rhodomine b also gives a green color so this gives the color to wherever it can mix with the water and wherever it want they can 
use it. However, it is not uh, what you call healthy for the uh, consumption of those foods. This is this rhodomyin B is harmful to the health. They they will feel irritation. They will feel vomitings, right? So it is also eye itching, and there is a lot of other diseases. Still, studies are going on. So this Food Safety Standards Act. We have a Food Safety Standards Act, 2006. Is already banned this, right? Using in a foods. This rhodomyin B was banned in using the foods, right? So it is a punishable offense. They can be used for textiles and all. That is not a matter. But for food, they have already banned, and still, lot of people are illegally using it, right? So it is an industrial dye which is not allowed food for food anywhere. Not only in India, but anywhere it is not allowed because it is a harmful to health. But still, they are using it. Now that's why Tamil Nadu government, even uh, Karnataka government, now Andhra Pradesh is also studying about it, right? So they have banned use, uh, you know, consumption of or production of cotton candies because of harmful nature of rhodomyin B. right so this is very simple article yeah next one national mission on edible oils very very important we will discuss the palm oils the uh, indian statistics related to it any way the questions can be asked okay so prime minister honorable uh, narendra modi ji has inaugurated the first oil mill oil mill means you know right so which can use uh, the seeds as the raw material and produce the oil right so the first oil mill under this national mission on edible oils that's why we have taken this article from press information bureau now let's be going into the discussion of the uh, national edible oil mission i want to discuss about the india's oil consumptions as well like uh, the uh, data is very very important even in upsc they have asked india is the importer largest import something like that so no need to worry don't scare about seeing this data i'll tell you how to or what data has to be remembered okay so i'll ask you some questions as well please try to answer it uh, you know whenever i have asked the question try to answer it even if it is wrong okay so let's see the production import and consumption of edible oils in the last 5 years we have a data till 2021 22 properly so here if you observe the total annual oil seeds that has been produced uh, uh, the source sorry sources the data this is not very important no need to worry but now what is the domestic production how much we are producing from indian territory so if you see this we have oil palm coconut right so other uh, oils and then rice bran cotton seed out of this which one is highest this you need to know this is in terms of lakh tons okay 1 ton is 1000 kg and 1 lakh you can multiply it so if you observe this data we have a rice bran and cotton seed oil is the highest right so these are from rice and cotton but directly from plant we have coconut coconut is the largest source and how much palm oil we are producing 2.7 lakh tons so what we need to remember here you need to remember this two important things and coconut as highest and palm oil how much we are producing these data you need to remember these are all not relevant now total domestic oil that we are producing this is very important so this 126.4 lakh tons is the total amount of oil that we are producing from india okay now if you see the imported ones imports total imports are 140 if you observe this data so that means what can someone tell me we are importing 140 lakh tons and we are producing 126.4 lakh tons so can tell me what inference can you make from this right so this number is very important i am not uh, discussing this for random thing so this data they will ask in the exam whether it is increasing so you can see the trend as well so increasing decreasing trend something like that they will ask now after observing these two things can someone tell me uh, any inference from it so from this inference what uh, what i want to tell we are producing domestically 126 and we are importing so that means what we are not self dependent we are dependent on the other countries right so that is the inference that we are dependent on other countries of related to the edible oils 
Edible oils means which they can, which we can eat. Some oils cannot be eaten. They are called as non-edible oils. And edible oils are those oils which we can consume at the room temperature. They remain in the liquid state. They remain in liquid state and we can consume them directly. Right? So we are dependent on the external markets. So the total oil consumed is 267.1 lakh tons. So see how much we are consuming. And we are only producing 126 but we are consuming 267 lakh tons. So our consumption is almost double the times, right? So this uh, inference you need to understand. That's how the questions are framed. They will not directly ask these numbers. It is very difficult to remember. The trends, whenever you see the data, what is the trends? What is the criteria of the trends that are existing? So that is important. And out of imported ones, if you see among these all popular oils, we are importing more of palm oil. The majority of our imports are coming from palm oil, right? So that is also very, very important fact. Which oil is most uh, contributed for our imports in the edible oil section? Something like that they may ask. That's how you need to extract the data. Now, what the most popular oils that we are consuming are these things. Groundnut, mustard, rapeseed, seasmum, safflor, niger seed, castor oil. So these are all the popular ones that we are producing from India. Okay. Now, what is national mission on edible oils? Right. So we have discussed about the condition in India. We are dependent on other countries, isn't it? Our consumption is double the times that we are producing. Right. And we are importing more of palm oil. These are all the interferences, interferences that you need to make out of it. Now, because of this, we are losing our foreign exchange. We need to give our rupees. Or, I mean, we, we need to convert them, our rupees into dollars and then we need to give it to the other markets, isn't it? We are wasting our own money. That's why government has launched national mission on edible oils, exclusively focusing on oil palm or palm oil. Don't confuse that this mission is applicable to all the oils. This mission is specifically launched for palm oils. That will also be asked in the exam. National mission on edible oils are launched for which uh, specific oil uh, focus on production. So they may ask in this pattern as well, right? So that's why government to reduce the dependency on external markets, they have launched national mission on edible oils. It is a centrally sponsored scheme. That means what? 60% of funds are given by central government and rest of the 30, uh, you know, percent, or sorry, rest of the 40% has to be borne by the states. Anyway, one important point is this. This scheme specifically focus on Northeast India and Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Andaman Nicobar Islands. Okay. Very important point. So for Northeastern regions, centrally sponsored schemes are 90% and 10% pattern. Right? So they are least developed. That's why 90% of funds will be given by the center itself. This scheme was launched specifically on Northeast and Andaman Nicobar region. Can anyone tell me what is the reason for this? Why they have specifically launched this only for Northeast and Andaman Nicobar? Can anyone comment on this? Yes, same CBWD, you are correct. We are importing more than uh, that we are uh, producing. Now tell me, what observation can you made? Like why it is specifically launched in Northeast region and the Andaman Nicobar Islands? Right? Okay, let me tell this. Because geographically, these crops are more having suitable soils in this region. Northeast and Andaman Nicobar, we need good amount of temperature, the loamy soil. So all the geographical conditions in the Northeast and then Andaman Nicobar Island suits for this cultivation. That's why government has focused on this. And what is the focus? To one thing, the production, right? The total amount, I would say the total amount and then productivity to increase the area as well as productivity per hectare we need to produce more so that is the objective of the scheme right to produce more palm oil and reduce the imports and the total financial outlay was given around 11,040 crore okay so the total outlay for this particular project was given 11,040 crore out of it 8,844 is given by the center itself and the rest of the 2,900 crores has to be earned by the states. Right? This is, this is not important. Total you can remember. And this proposed scheme has subsumed the 
one existing scheme that is very important which scheme was subsumed into national mission on edible oils national food security mission oil palm program this was already an existing scheme now they have subsumed merged into this particular scheme okay so this is about the national mission on edible oils and few more uh, important targets are there those numbers are also important for us so under this scheme an additional area so whatever the existing for example 1 lakh hectares was there just uh, an imaginary number now the additional area of 6.5 lakh hectares was to be converted by 2025 26 this is very very important to remember so what is the target of national edible oil so they may ask in the statement based as well so additional whatever already existing beyond that we are going to con or add 6.5 lakh hectares by 2025-26 and another 10 lakh hectares by 2000 uh, I mean ultimately so there is no target so ultimately we are going to add 10 lakh more under this palm oil production similarly this is the area I mean the amount of land that we are going to cultivate now there is also target for production amount of weight of the oil palm so this is also important total 11.20 lakh tons by 2025-26 so not only increasing the area but we are also aiming to produce more amount of palm oil that is 11.20 lakh tons by 2025-26 and 28 lakh tons by 2030. So these numbers are important okay even though they are difficult to remember but you have to. And for the first time for the first time under the scheme government is giving price assurance for the palm oil. If you consider the other crops like rice, wheat or moong we have a minimum support price right. We have discussed in many of the sessions, MSP, minimum support price. So before the uh, sowing season itself, government decides certain price uh, to buy those things. Similarly, they have assured this price, right? And why they have assured that we will see here. All these facts, all these mechanisms are very, very important. This is little bit lengthy article, but very important. You will see at least one question from it. So the oil palm farmers are collected from fresh fruit bunches so if you see here fresh fruit bunches of palm palm right so this palm is collected and they are they produce oil from this fruit bunches but now the prices of this are dependent on the external markets like price fluctuation fluctuations based on the market so whatever the demand whenever there is a demand the prices will increase and wherever there is a no demand so the prices will fall so there is a fluctuations in the international market that's why farmers are not willing to cultivate because they don't know whether they will get profits or they will get loss they don't know they don't want to take risk that's why the farmers are not ready to cultivate the palm oil now what government has uh, done they have they are giving the minimum price right like for other crops they are assuring the price that we will give this much so you no need to worry so farmers what they will do they are encouraged to cultivate it now they are uh, you know has trust on the government that yes government is giving certain amount of support for us so we are ready to cultivate now that's why government is willing to give price assurance through this scheme and farmers will be readily cultivated right so this is the issue for fluctuations and what amount government will give that is decided on the last five years last five years average price for example in 2020 there is a x 2021 y z so something like that they will take the last five year prices in the market and they will average it and those prices are paid by the government right so if they are not getting any if they are getting from the market the same price they can sell it there but if there is less amount in the market then those whatever the gap for example 100 rupees is the market price and now this year it was just a 90 rupees they are not I mean they are losing 10 rupees so this gap will be given by the government so farmers are assured now they will get at least certain minimum price if they cultivate so that is the objective of the scheme right and also beyond that uh, one more important thing the price was named as viability price that price which government is assuring is called as viability price they will ask in the exam viability price is related to which of the crops so it is nothing but palm oil okay like minimum support price we have 22 crops and fair or uh, uh, remuneration price for sugarcane we have so similarly viability price is for oil palms very very important so we have seen the calculation of price and beyond that government is also asking private industries whoever are procuring this 
to give extra 14% rupees whatever government already decided the viability price beyond that the companies which are the industries which are procuring has to give additional 14% right so through all these things what government has, was able to do government is supporting or encouraging farmers to take or cultivate the palm oils so that we can reduce our dependency on the external markets that is the aim of the scheme so all the facts we have discussed very comprehensively i hope this is clear now we have seen what is uh, the context we have seen and we have seen what is edible oils right and then data related to it we have seen the national mission on uh, or the scheme of national mission on edible oils we have seen right so the details how government is supporting all these things we have seen any doubts in this okay next article is indo pacific economic framework for prosperity so the full form is also important if you are writing the exams which are not uh, very higher level like civil services engineering service also they are asking uh, full forms and many other ssc whatever the exams so indo pacific economic framework for prosperity so observe it see whenever you are reading something observe the terminologies used there from the terminology itself you will get certain clue okay so indo pacific region they are talking about indo pacific that means indian ocean where india here the indian ocean is there and then pacific region right so in the west of america so they are talking about the indo pacific region indo pacific economic framework for prosperity for prosperity means the growth of the nations surrounding this region that is itself is giving some clue right now what is the context our honorable minister shri piyush goel ji has virtually participated in this conference yesterday so that's why there was an article in press information bureau now they won't in pib you won't see this what is ipef and all they won't give in detail they will just mention the context but we need to extract the details and we need to read for our exams right so let's see about the details of indo pacific economic framework for, for prosperity it was launched in 2022 may 2022 let me discuss the background as well before uh, discussing about it during the covid times 2020 and 21 there was a hindrance in supply chain mechanism supply chain means starting like interlinking of different markets like china india so wherever it is required wherever it is excess they will export it and wherever there is a insufficient they will import so these are all connection of the transport supply of goods and services are to, together called as supply chains now during the covid times china as a uh, nation has a, a high producing because of the cheap labor and they have got the advantage now what they have done semiconductor uh, semiconductor chips and whatever the essential uh, health kits all these things they have stopped exporting and most of the countries were depended on china now what they will do this countries need goods but now china has stopped during the covid so this supply chains has affected the countries at the receiving are how affected that's why the countries like india usa they have come together they have signed an agreement that we should not any more dependent on certain countries we should expand the markets right we should produce them from our itself we should not harm the supply chain supply chain resilient uh, mechanisms so that's what the countries have come together and they have established in may 2022 after the covid waves right so it aims to strengthen the economic partnership between the indo pacific countries right it should not depend on china that is the main aim of the project now it was signed by four regional partners sorry 14 regional partners you can see here india australia japan thailand singapore philippines malaysia vietnam indonesia new zealand united states republic of korea brunei and fiji these are all the countries which are in either in indian ocean region or in the pacific region so these 14 countries signed together to implement this project right so this fact is very very important the countries are also important now what is the objective i have already explained to promote resilience sustainability inclusive independent economic growth for all the countries without depending on any particular country so you can see here the china was excluded all the countries china is also having border with the pacific ocean in terms of south china sea but they have excluded china so the main aim is to sideline the china and then grow uh, as together right so this is the initiative of ipef 
and this is not a free trade agreement. Free trade agreement means there, there will not be any custom duties, there will not be any taxes on imports and exports, right? So it is completely free. Whoever want to send, they can send. Whoever want to receive, they can receive. But this is not like that. It is an independent just to promote the supply chain, to connect uh, or self-dependent on the countries, right? It should not be dependent on any country. There are total four main pillars that was established. This is important. Under the agreement, total four pillars were envisaged. One is supply chain resilience, that continuous flow of goods, inputs, raw material should be present. That is the sub, uh, first objective. Then clean energy, clean infrastructure, decarbonization infrastructure. So it is like environmental friendly infrastructure has to be encouraged. That is the second. Third is proper taxation. Some companies will search for weak tax areas and then they gain lot of profit. So such type of corruption taxation should be avoided. That is other third pillar. And final fourth pillar is fair and resilient trade. So the trade should not be harmed even in conditions like COVID. It should be free, right? So these are the four pillars of this uh, IPEF. Any doubts in this? Okay. So if not, we will move ahead to the next article. In case if you have any doubts, you can ask in the comment section. So I will explain it. Next one, Sagar Parikrama. Sagar means ocean, right? You all know. Recently, I studied itself, our uh, Ministry of Fisheries, Sri Purushottam Rupala, was about to launch a book and videos related to the Sagar Parikrama. So that's why we have taken this article. Now, what is the Sagar Parikrama? We have 7,500 kilometers length of coastline and we have, uh, India is one of the second largest fisheries producing country, right? So, in this background, understand this, the main objective is to decimate information related to the fisheries, to the local uh, fishery people, whoever have dependent on the fisheries, right? Whoever has dependent on this fisheries, government want to give information. Sustainable fisheries, you should not affect the ocean condition. It should be healthy fisheries, you should not stock them. So to encourage the healthy lifestyle related to the fisheries, this program was launched by the Ministry of Fisheries under the Department of Fisheries, right? So that is the objective of the program. And also, it aims to promote responsibility fisheries. Responsibility means you should not affect the other living beings. You should not affect the ocean condition. Whatever you want, you take and then do business, but without affecting the other things. So that is the responsibility fisheries, which government wants to promote, right? So the navigation will be there is a team which will roam throughout India, the coastline. It will move on from one state to other state and they will promote awareness using the local authorities, right? So that is about the uh, scheme of Sagar Parikrama. It is just a normal objective. You can remember which department has launched and what is the objective, right? That will be sufficient for our exam. Next, Ministry of Minority Affairs has approved certain projects. Very factual, I'll just go through in a minute. That's why we have taken this article from Press Information Bureau. So they have launched, sent, uh, I mean, they have launched infrastructure development in Central Institute of Himalayan Cultural Studies. So this institution is important. Center, Central Institute of Himalayan Cultural Studies, they have given 40 crore, but that is not important for our exam. What is the Central Institute of Himalayan Cultural Studies? where it is located, that is important for our exam, okay? So this is located in Dahum, Arunachal Pradesh, in Kameng district. Dahum is a town where this is located. What is the objective? The objective is to promote, preserve the culture of local communities. India is a very diversified country. You come to uh, Telangana, we have a different culture. You come to Andhra Pradesh, we have a different culture. You come to Bihar, we have a different culture. Right? You come to uh, Uttar Pradesh, we have a different culture. Similarly, in Northeast, we have a much rich culture to protect, to promote their identities, cultures in the North because there are a lot of tribes. That's why this uh, institute was launched by the Ministry of Culture. Ministry of Culture has launched and it is located in Arunachal Pradesh. Similarly, Ministry of Minority Affairs has also given some funding to Center for Jain manuscriptology. So manuscripts means the older scripts written by some ancient authors, right? So this was launched in Gujarat University. This is important where it was launched and all they may ask in the matching. One more 
important thing that they have launched center for gurumukhi script gurumukhi is the script of sikh religion right so this center was launched in university of delhi this is again important and last center for jain studies in devi ahalya vishwavidyalaya again they have launched here it is manuscriptology jain manuscriptology was launched in gujarat university jain studies the center for jain studies was launched in indoor campus of devi ahalya university right so these facts need to be remember for the exam any doubts okay let's move ahead to the next article central road infrastructure fund see these are all articles whatever whatever we are discussing are not covered in the newspapers you have to either cover press information bureau or you have to watch the videos the questions are made mostly from press information bureau because that is a government website so if you are a person who can read try to read them even you will no need to watch the videos also but if you are a person who is affiliated towards watching videos rather than reading you can cover here so press information bureau uh, facts are very very important right so union minister of road transport nitin gadkari ji has allocated certain funds to the infrastructural projects in the states the funds are taken from central road infrastructure fund there is already a separate fund created by the ministry and the funds were allocated to certain states uh, telangana karnataka there are three four states which they have allocated that's why central road infrastructure fund becomes important now learning about the central road uh, infrastructure fund the name itself you can see here road infrastructure it is related to creating road infrastructure you all know that we have uh, losing more than 3 lakh lives every year because of the improper roads right so that's why this fund was launched we will see the background this fund was initially called as central road fund central road fund initially it was launched in 2000 Year, I mean the year 2000, right? So later it was converted to Central Road Infrastructure Fund. And what is the purpose? Purpose is very basic that they want to create a proper infrastructure in the roads. That is the purpose. Now, where they will get these funds? That is important. From where? Whether government is allocating separately or from where? That is important. It is being collected through cess. Cess means a tax on tax. Cess means a tax on tax. so already if you are consuming any or anything like if you are doing any business there is a 1% 2% cess agriculture cess we have road cess we have so there are different cess it is a extra tax that you pay for certain purpose and this funds has to this cess has to use only that purpose that was decided it is not like government can convert this money into something else they can only spend on this particular fund so that's the role of cess right so it was being collected from petrol and diesel so petrol and diesel is one of the highest consumptions that we make 2% cess so for every rupees that uh, for every liter 100 rupees you are paying 2 rupees went for this particular cess right so because it is related to the road and petrol and diesel are related to the road itself they are collecting into this fund and this fund is allocated to the infrastructure development of the roads right so that's how the mechanism and the facts very important fact is previously this fund was administered under ministry of road transport previously when they were uh, when it was central road fund it was under ministry of road now this fund was shifted to ministry of finance central road infrastructure fund is under ministry of finance anyway this ministry has the uh, what you call power to allocate to infrastructure right but it is administered by ministry of finance that is important so it is embarked for various infrastructure projects uh, not only for roads so they may ask you this as well this fund can be not only used for transport energy water and sanitation can be spent right so this is about the central infrastructure road fund any doubts in this okay we'll move to the last article for today but very very important this article is very very important the data is very important Uh, we have collected everything at a single uh, space or I in mean, a single point you can uh, uh, you know remember these facts you no need to read for any other sources as well right so the gender inequality index 2022 has been released by united nations development program united nations right under it uh, it is a permanent body of united nations 
in there as part of human development report. So already there is a report HDI, HDI and in this one a small report is gender gap report. So HDI is a broader report within that we have a gender inequality index as a small part of this report. So we will see what is HDI and then we will see what is uh, gender index, gender inequality index. After that we will see Indian ranking, right? how it performed in HDI, how it performed in gender inequality index. We will also see the top countries. At the last we will see the top countries that have performed well in HDI as well as the global gender inequality report. Right? So all these things are very important uh, for our exams. Okay. Moving to the first one, the broader report, the HDI, Human Development Index. You all know the there is there should be a parameters to estimate how we are growing, how humans are moving forward. And here in the case, this report measures the country's growth. They cannot take individual growth that is taken care by the uh, country itself. But now how countries are moving forward. So to evaluate that, there need to be some parameters how they can evaluate India is moving forward on what basis. So because of that, they have launched United Nations, which is responsible for the world nations, right? So they have launched United uh, Human Development Index. You can see here the index. Uh, so AIM CPWD, you have asked why different states have different uh, prices of the petrol. See, when the petrol was entering into India, for example, this is India, right? So for example, this is India and petrol we are uh, importing. So there is a, around 20 rupees, for example, per liter. Now, central government will take care of 50%. They may levy certain tax, central government, okay? And this petrol and diesel are not part of GST, goods and service tax. So this is given independently to the state itself. So the role of central government, they will levy certain tax, uniform tax across all the states. For example, 50% extra. So 20 plus 10, 30 rupees. Now, after going into the borders of other states, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Maharashtra, we have different states. And the states have the power to levy their own tax. Okay. So Maharashtra can levy 50% tax. Karnataka can levy only 10% tax. So they have freedom. It is not kept under GST to have a uniform structure. It, in future they will bring, but as of now they have not under GST. That's why we have a different price in the different states because the tax structure of different states are different. I hope this is clear. Okay. Yes. Now coming back to uh, HDI, Human Development Index. They have measured uh, with the three dimensions. These dimensions are very, very important. Right. So there are total three dimensions how they are measuring each country's growth. One is long and healthy life, having good health. So that is the first dimension. Yeah. Next dimension is knowledge. Second is knowledge about our learning. Right. Third is standard of living, how valuable uh, life we are living. So the total three dimensions they have taken. Within that, they have again the uh, indicators. First one in the health, life expectancy at birth. So when we are giving our birth, how many years an individual can burn in this country? Now at present, for example, we have 67 years. A, a person in India on an average who is, uh, I mean, gives birth in India can live up to 67 years. So that is the measure that this particular index has taken. Next one is in knowledge criteria, they, we have expected years of schooling. So when we are starting our education, how many years we can educate in the school from starting from first class to 12th class, how many years we are expected to take education that is expected years of birth. Second one, uh, I mean indicator within knowledge, we have two indicators, mean years of schooling. This above one is expected how many years one can take education, but this is actual schooling after completing of our 18 years, the survey will be taken how many years of education we have completed. Someone may stop at five, fifth class, sixth class, seventh class because of various reasons. So these are taken as part of measuring our knowledge. And the last one, gross national income, that is money, how much we are able to produce in the economy. So that is these three, uh, I mean, these three are dimensions and these are all the indicators 
based on that they will measure the HDI and accordingly they will give ranks to the different countries. So this is the measure of HDI and it is measured from 0 to 1. 0 is the worst and 1 is the best. So finally this is weighted average and done. no need to worry about learning the process. So 0 to 1 and 1 being the best and 0 is the worst. Okay. So it goes beyond income. You have seen we have measured knowledge, we have measured health. Right. So it is not just about the income. Now what is gender inequality index? Within HDI, within human development index, we have a sub report that is gender inequality index. So if you see here, this also you need to know. They will already they have asked in the exams. Again, there are three dimensions in the gender inequality index. One is reproduction health. So in terms of giving birth, how healthy the women are. Second is empowerment, how empowered the women in the country are. And finally, labor market, how easy the women are able to participate in the economy that doing the jobs, right? So these three are the dimensions which measures and within this again there are indicators that is also important. So uh, I may be teaching a lot of facts, but these are all relevant for our exams. Okay. So within reproduction health, we have a maternal mortality. So how many women are being died when they are giving, uh, when they are in pregnancy or while giving the birth. So that is maternal mortality and adolescent fertility means, adolescence means 10 to 19 years. Adolescence means 10 to 19 years and adolescent fertility means uh, who are giving birth in this age. So now some, uh, someone tell me, should adolescent fertility be high or adolescent fertility should be low? Tell me the answer. I'm asking the question from your side. So I just told that adolescent fertility means those fertility, the amount of children, the number of children can be produced between 10 to 19 years. So should, should this be higher or should be this lower? I need answer from your side that would be great if you answer okay right okay as I did not receive any answer I'm going ahead see adolescent fertility is between 10 to 19 so what is the I mean age of marriage for women it is 18 years right so beyond that if once they get married so at least one year it will take to give birth to child so if it is more Yes, it should be lower. Very good, Malini. If it is more, that means what? There is a more child marriages, right? So if this adolescent fertility is higher, I mean, there is a more births of adolescent in this age. That means what? There are more child births. Yes, all of you are uh, correct. Garage, Rachna. Yes, it should be low. So this child marriages should be always low, right? So this adolescent fertility and then maternity mortality are measured in reproductive health. Next one is empowerment, how women are empowered, empowered means how they can take, take the decisions. These are measured with the two indicators, parliament represent, uh, representation. So how many MPs, MLAs are there in the India? So if you see, there is only 12 to 14 percent out of 100 uh, percent, I mean 100 seats, only 12 to 14 are occupied by women, rest of all 80, 85 are occupied by men. So we should increase this, the women participation should increase, right? So this is taken and then educational attainment, how the women are educated in that country in the second secondary as well as above graduation level. Finally, labor force participation, how they are participating in the labor force. So these all are measured and uh, calculated as a gender inequality index. And unlike very important point to understand, please, und uh, please listen here, right? He, in the HDI, we have seen 0 to 1, 1 being the good, right? So that means human development index is in a good position. Now, in case of gender inequality index, it should be less, 0 to 1. 0 means there is a less inequality. 1 means there is a more, equal, more inequality. This is very important. They will ask in the exam. HDI, we should have more score so that there is more human development. If it is more in the inequality, I mean, if it is 1, that means there is 
perfect inequality. So, if it is 0, that means there is no inequality. This is about the gender inequality index. Now, coming to the India's performance in HDI, first report that we have taken, this year it was released 2023-24. India's HDI value has increased. HDI value increased means what? It is a good sign. It is not gender inequality, but HDI value has increased in 2022, right? So, we have got 0.644 out of 1. So, we have improved and the rank that India got is 134. This is very, very important. The total out of 193 countries, India has got 134 rank, right? So, India has saw improvement across HDI indicators. We have seen three indicators are there, life expectancy, then education, then GNI. I mean education in the sense knowledge. So, total three are there and we have improved in all the three, which is a very good sign. And life expectancy at birth, first indicator, we were able to improve 67.2 to 67.7. So, the, the uh, I mean the amount of days that we are going to spend are more. And expected years of schooling, how many years are expected to be studied by a child who born? So, is 12.6 years, which is again a good sign and mean years of schooling. So, the final years that uh, the child will be educated has also increased. So, these are all numbers are important for our exam. And GNI, the per capita, the per individual how much we are consuming has also increased to $6,951. All these data are important and we have uh, performed well, right? Now, coming to the gender index gender, we have seen HDI, now gender inequality index is also important. So, out of 193 countries, we are at 108. In HDI, we are 134, but in gender, we have performed well. And the score that we got is 0 0.437. And this score should be as much as low. 0 is perfect equality, right? So, we have reduced our score when compared to the last year. Last year, we got 0 0.490, but this year, 437. So, our score, we were able to reduce it. Right? So, you can see the trend also. Since 2018, we were having 0 0.5. So, it kept reducing, okay? which is a good sign. We are reducing our inequality in terms of gender. Not at uh, Trida. Uh, so, you are saying 22 years to get marriage. Uh, it is actually 21. Government is yet to uh, pass the bill. I mean, there is a proposal, but the, it is just under the consideration. As of now, it is 18 for women and 21 for men and government is uh, you know studying it they have already appointed a committee that women age should also be increased to 21 but it is not yet come into the picture okay remember this once that is come we will discuss in current affairs or you will see in social media as well okay so this is about india's performance in uh, gender gap also the score is better than global average global average is 0.462 so they may ask in the statement based India's, uh, I mean, gender inequality rate is higher than global average, they may ask. We are performing better. Our score is lesser. It should be less, right? So, global average is 0.462 and ours is 0.437, which is lower. That will also be asked in the exam. And South Asia is 0.478. So, we are less than that. India's adolescent birth rate, right, is 16.3. Last year, it was 17.1 and we were able to reduce it to 16.3, which is a good thing. So, birth rate also, we were, adults and birth rate also, we were able to reduce. Similarly, anyway, one negative aspect is the gender gap between men and women is more in India. So, we were not able to, in terms of labor force, so if men are 76, out of 100, 76 are doing jobs, out of 100, women are only 28. So, the gender gap in terms of labor force, we are in a negative position. This point is uh, important to remember. Okay? Right. So, all these facts, but anyway, I am stressing it to explain you to remember for a longer period. And if you see the best performers, the global ranks with the highest HDI, we are talking about HDI, not with the gender inequality. Switzerland is the top with 0.962. It should be higher, right? One is a perfect HDI. Second is Norway. Third is Iceland. So, these three ranks you have top three you have to remember. Switzerland, Norway, Iceland, right? So, that is the top three performers in the HDI. In terms of gender, Denmark, Norway, Switzerland. So, here Switzerland is at top, but here it is third. 
Norway is second and here again it is second, same, so you can remember. Iceland is third and here there is no Iceland, right? So this is about the articles of today. Now let's move to the factual pointers. Okay, yeah. We have five, six facts uh, for our uh, today's session. We'll see what is that. On March 12, 2024, so just three days back, India and Dominican Republic has signed Joint Economic and Trade Committee in Santi Domingo. So it is a Latin American country. So we have signed an agreement, Joint Economic and Trade Committee was established between these two countries, India and Dominican Republic. Next, Security Belt 2024 exercise. This was conducted by China, Iran and Russia. India not involved. So China, Russia and Iran, they have conducted. And where they have conducted? Gulf of Oman. What is the uh, objective? Just to make ready because these are friendly countries now because America and European countries have divided, right? So just to ready for wars and all, they are uh, exercising it. So this is important, security belt 2024 exercise. Next, International Day of Action for Rivers was celebrated on yesterday, March 14 every year. International Day of, our, of Actions for Rivers and the theme is Water for All. Water for All is the theme of this year International Day for Action for Rivers. Next, so Kerala became the first state in the India, becoming the first state in India to declare man-animal conflict as the state-specific disaster. So there were a lot of deaths recently in Kerala because of the man-animal conflict, right? So we are going into their areas, but now we are pointing towards their uh, effect. But anyway, this is declared as a disaster by Kerala and the, this is the first state that uh, declared the animal man-animal conflict as a state-specific disaster, right? So that is again one more fact. Next, Kirti, Kelo India Rising Talent Identification. This is full form is important and the objective is also important. So, Ministry of Sports, Youth and Sports Affairs has launched Kirti Initiative to hunt, to search the efficient persons to participate in the sports between the age of 9 to 18. Very factual, right? So, the age is important and Kirti is important, right? The full form as well as the objective. Next, Kanyan Dakshinamurti from Tamil Nadu has won Sahitya Academy Award for Translation. Kanyan Dakshinamurti has won Sahitya Academy Award for Translation. So he translated English book or English novel Black Hill into Tamil, right? So it was named as Karunguram in Tamil. So he got this translation award. Any doubts in this? Now let's move to the practice questions. Okay, first question. First question related to the Ranji Trophy. Which of the following statements is or correct about Ranji Trophy? Okay, we have discussed it in detail. Ranji Trophy is the domestic first class cricket championship. That is the first statement. Second statement, the trophy is named after England and Sussex cricket uh, cricketer. Kunvarshi Ranjit Singh ji. Okay. So that is the second statement. It was first played even before the World War II event. It was first played even before the World War II event has happened. Right. Fourth statement. Mumbai has won the 2023-24 title for the 42nd time. So these are the four statements. So what is the answer now? Okay, let me uh, go ahead. So if you have, I mean, if your first one, someone have answered it as A. Okay, let's see what is the answer. Ranji Trophy is domestic, yes, domestic championship, that is correct. The trophy is named after England and Sussex player, yes, Sri Ranjit Singh ji, that is correct. And when the first trophy was played, tell me here, 1934-35. And when was World War II happened? 1944. So, it was played before uh, World War II event only. So, third statement is also correct. 
That's how the examiners confuse. You need to think, you need to apply. First read the statement, identify the years, then you take the decision of the answer, right? So 1944, World War II and the trophy has played 1934-35. So this is also correct. Mumbai has won the title for the 42nd time. So answer is D, not A, okay? Only two answers I got. Everyone, please try to answer it. Even if it is wrong, it's fine. Uh, that's how you remember in the exam. Next one, which of the following statements about Indo-Pacific Economic Framework is incorrect? They are saying, they are asking about the incorrect statement. IPEF is like a free trade agreement, which involves reducing the tariffs on the imports and exports made between the member countries. That is the first statement. Second one, it has four pillars and supply chain is one of the pillars of IPEF. Second, it was launched to build economic integration in the Indo-Pacific region. The last statement, India is part of the initiative. So what is the answer? So very direct, we have seen as India is part, so D can be eliminated easily. It was launched to build economic integration of Indo-Pacific region, right? Indo-Pacific region only. So, okay, this is correct, uh, fine. Uh, India is part, so that's why D should be wrong. They are asking incorrect. And this is also correct, so this should be wrong. It has four pillars, yes, correct, with uh, one uh, supply chain. And this is not a free trade agreement. There is no such thing, right? So, this is wrong and hence answer is A. Yes, Ramya, Malini, AMC, BWD, all of you are correct. So, that is about uh, the IPEF. Next one, Gender Inequality Index is a publication of. Yes, Subrat, you are also correct. A is the answer. Gender Inequality Index is a publication of World Economic Forum, World Bank, United Nations Development Program, United Nations Women. So, what is the answer? Yes, Trida, you are correct. Before the earlier one, all of you are correct. Uh, who have answered it as A. And the Gender Inequality Index is part of HDI, Human Development Index. And this is not released by World Bank or World Economic Forum. You may confuse with uh, the United Nations, but United Nations Development Program, UNDP. So, answer is C. Very direct question. We have discussed this. Right? Yes, AMC, BWD, Ramya, Malni, all of you are correct. Answer is C. Next question. Consider the following statements regarding Central Road and Infrastructure Fund. It is used for the railway infrastructure as well as the social infrastructure works. So this is the uh, first statement. It is managed by the Ministry of Finance. So this is the second statement. So there are two statements, right? Which of the following statements given are, is are correct? Yes, Rajkumar, you are also, all of you are correct, who have answered it as C. Yes, Subrat as well. So, answer for this question. First statement, it is used for railway infrastructure as well as social infrastructure works. No, this is wrong. It is not related to the railway. It is road and some certain water sanitation, right? So, first it should be wrong. So, A and C are eliminated. It is managed by Ministry of Finance. Yes, currently it is managed by Ministry of Finance, not Ministry of Road, right? So, answer is B. Yes, Malini, you are correct. Okay. Next question. Last question, and this is a little bit typical question asked in UPSC Civil Services in the recent, pen, uh, recent trends. With reference to Sagar Parikrama, consider the following statements. Statement 1. It is a campaign to promote the Indian seafood industry. So that is a, a statement one. And statement two, it is aimed at strengthening the fisheries sector in India. So there are two statements and they are asking uh, the choose one of the them. Both statement one and statement two are correct. Both statements are correct. And statement two is a correct explanation to the statement one. So this statement two has explained statement one they are saying. Next one. Both are correct, but statement 2 does not clearly explain the statement 1. 
So that is the second. Statement 1 is correct, but statement 2 is incorrect. They are saying second statement is wrong, first statement is correct. Statement 1 is incorrect, but statement 2 is uh, correct, they are saying, right? So let's see, it is campaign to promote seafood industry. No, it is not to promote the Indian seafood industry. It aims to encourage the local fishermen to have a sustainable fisheries, right? It is not commercial encouragement. So statement 1 is wrong, so answer can be easily done. Answer is D. It is aimed at strengthening fishery sector, yes, right? So that is about the question. I know most of five is A. No, it is not A because first statement is wrong. It is not to promote seafood, okay? Right. So that is about today's session. We had a very good uh, discussion. It is. It was a little bit lengthy, but yes, worth. there's a lot of facts, lot of issues. So try to remember and thanks for watching. Have a great evening.